الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعض فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتاب تبيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified And we pray this day for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam brothers and sisters in Islam here at Masjid al-Husna in Bandar Sanwi opposite to Sanwi pyramid assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bandar Sunway, of course, in Kuala Lumpur, in Malaysia. Our topic this morning is a very important one. And soon to become a subject of critical importance, maybe within a year or so from now. The punishment for zina, which is sexual relations between two people who are not married to each other, regardless of whether they are married themselves otherwise or not. The punishment for zina or adultery and fornication in the religion of Abraham Ibrahim alayhi salam while we are addressing a Muslim audience today's lecture is meant primarily for the world of Judaism and the world of Christianity and we pray that Allah may take this lecture to Christians and to Jews around the world. Ameen. We have a number of difficulties and the success of the lecture depends upon our being able to present it in a simple way. So we pray that Allah may help us to do that. Secondly, the, th the topic is very big and we have to try to compress this topic and the information provided and the analysis within a specific time frame and we pray that Allah may help us to, that, to do that as well why is this topic so important now that's the first thing we need to explain the they call it the Arab Spring you know the uprisings that toppled Husni Mubarak in Egypt and toppled Zainuddin bin Ali in Tunisia and is threatening to topple uh, Assad in Syria and the other one in Yemen some of it is not just spring showers eh? because some of it looks like a Yankee Jihad because NATO is not at all concealing <laughs> its active involvement the Americans and the Jews are not 
concealing anymore their active involvement. We analyzed this Arab Spring, the Arab uprisings, some five months ago. And we came to the conclusion that the ultimate benefactor, the one who is going to benefit the most, will be Israel. Why? We anticipated that after the toppling of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt, for example, and Egypt is the key state involved, that the Egyptian armed forces which, and I hope you don't mind my saying so, acted in a suspiciously docile way. Don't be annoyed with me. That the Egyptian armed forces are now going to continue true to form to hold free and fair elections in Egypt. And it's a foregone conclusion that when the elections take place, and the result of the elections would be that the Islamic parties in Egypt would win by a landslide majority and Israel will be smiling. <laughs> Why would Israel smile? <laughs> Why? And when the Islamic government comes, so-called Islamic government comes to Egypt, it will have a domino effect on other Arab countries which are also experiencing the same so-called Arab Spring. And so a number of Islamic governments, so-called Islamic governments, because I don't recognize this as Islamic, I recognize the Khilafah and Darul Islam. A number of Islamic governments are going to emerge. And then you're going to see the war of words that the Arabs are now supporting the Palestinians with weapons and there is terrorism coming from the Arab world and it is threatening to Israel something just happened one week ago which is very convenient in which about I think 11 Jews were killed in Sinai very convenient for the Israeli government which was under severe pressure internally from demonstrations and suddenly, when the Israeli Mossad acts, the pressure is off for the Israeli government. But the people of Israel are being prepared that Islam is rising and that terrorism, Islamic terrorism, is now going to be grave threat to the state of Israel. And when Egypt actively supports the Palestinian cause and intervenes to attempt to try to relieve the people of Gaza from the siege of Gaza and some rockets are fired and so on, then Israel will say, this is causus bellum. This is justification for us to launch the attack that they've already planned pre-plan. Britain never became a ruling state. Pax Britannica did not come into being without big wars that which Britain had to wage all over the world. British, British troops were right here in Malaysia. And the United States did not become the ruling state in the world without waging big wars. And there are US Marines all over the world today. It might be difficult to find some U.S. Marines in America now. <laughs> and so, if you've read Jerusalem in the Quran, which was published 10 years ago, and now we have it in Bahasa as well, Jerusalem, the Dalam al-Quran, you would know our interpretation of the Hadith of Tamim Muddari. You can say what you want about that Hadith. It's too late now because our analysis is showing that the facts in the hadith are correct that Israel is going to replace the United States as the next ruling state that's their plan I am not saying this is what I want 
I'm saying this is their plan. And given the kind of governments we have in the world of Islam today, I see no reason why Israel should not succeed. No. But Israel cannot become the next ruling state in the world without also waging big wars, which I expect to commence 2012. That's why there's all this hype about 2012. So we have a little breathing space now. The US dollar is likely to collapse. And when the US dollar collapses, and we've been saying this for 15 years now, did some angel whisper to us? Or was it a jinn who was talking to us and telling us 15 years ago that the US dollar will collapse? Who oh, is Imran Hussein a prophet? What nonsense. What absolute nonsense. No, it is an analysis. Analysis of the Quran and the Hadith that led us to the conclusion 15 years ago that the US dollar will have to collapse. And then I expect I hope I'm wrong and then I expect that there's going to be panic around the world particularly for those who are using the weak currencies people will want to get rid of their paper money as fast as they can and the more they try to get rid of it the more the prices are going to be rising runaway inflation <laughs> and when you're trying to dump your paper money what's the first thing you'll do to buy food <laughs> so within 24 hours perhaps all the supermarkets will be cleared of everything they have <laughs> and a food shortage naturally will come and with a food shortage you're going to have riots and anarchy so it's a terrible 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 immediate future that is facing us but before Israel wants before Israel launches her big wars before she attacks Pakistan to destroy Pakistan's nuclear plants and nuclear weapons, I expect that the Zionist alliance around the world will try to make Islam look even worse than they've already done. Because when the Egyptian government says we are Islamic, the cry will come, why don't you enforce the Sharia? You have a Sharia. Come on, enforce it. The cry will come internally and externally. And the Egyptian government will have to bow and say, yes, we are going to enforce the Sharia. And it is at that time that they're going to bring two people who will confess to adultery. They'll both be married, but not to each other. And they'll come before the Egyptian Sharia court and say we want to be punished in accordance with the Sharia <laughs> and then the Sharia court I expect I can be wrong would rule that they have to be punished in accordance with the law of punishment for zina in Islam the Sharia court will declare that that punishment is stoning to death Oh, but for 2,000 years now, for 2,000 years now, mankind abandoned that law. The first to abandon it, I hope they don't be annoyed because of my saying so, were you, the Jews. You abandoned it. The Christians abandoned it. And now the world of Islam is going to be portrayed as cruel. <laughs> and CNN and Al Jazeera, I know the two sisters, will be there to record this punishment of stoning to death. That the two people will be wrapped, wrapped in blankets or cloth or something, covering the whole body. So you can't see their faces perhaps. And then there'll be two holes dug in the ground. And they'll be lowered into the ground with only the head and the chest perhaps showing above the ground. And then the stones have to be of a particular size, not too small, not too big. And then the stones will start to rain down. It's going to be a bloody mess. And this so-called barbaric, 
punishment. Even the Jewish controlled media will declare this to be barba, barbaric, barbarism. <laughs> yes. And then they'll seek to defame Islam. They want to make Islam look as something terrible. And the objective will be to turn all the rest of the world against Islam and against Muslims. But they plan their plans. And Allah plans his plans. And Allah is the best of planners. And so today, from Masjid al Husna, we say to them, We have another plan. Let's hear it. We are proud of the fact, proud of the fact that the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam are the only people on the face of the earth today. Who are ready? Millions of us are ready to implement the law which is your law and which you have shamelessly abandoned. I am proud of the fact that so many millions of Muslims are going to ask for the law to be enforced and for these people to be stoned to death regardless of whether it makes us look bad or makes us look good that is going to be pleasing to Allah whether the punishment is actually given or not is not this issue now what is at issue is that in the hearts of the people we are ready today 2000 years after you abandon your law we are ready to enforce your law that you are not enforcing yourself that's the message we send to you today from Masjid Sunway Masjid al Husn. and so here is evidence we saying to the world of Jews we saying to the world of Christians this punishment of stoning to death for the adulterer is in the Torah it is still there in the Torah you are not enforcing the law but Islam has produced people Muslims who are prepared to enforce your law today 2000 years after you abandon it here is evidence as dazzling as the sunshine that this is the truth in Islam and that Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam is indeed a true prophet before we can attempt to discuss the subject however and explain Islamic viewpoint on the subject we do have to teach a lesson on methodology and I hope you'll bear with me for a while let's try to do it as fast as we can methodology for the pursuit of knowledge methodology for the pursuit of truth methodology for the study of the revealed scripture in the Quran at the very beginning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded Iblis and commanded sorry commanded the angels to bow down and prostrate before Adam alayhi salam why did he do that is not our subject the Quran says for sajadu they all prostrated they made sajda illa Iblis except Iblis if we use the wrong methodology of taking a verse of the Quran or a verse of the Bible in isolation by itself we'll come to the conclusion that since the command was given to the angels and they all bow down 
But Iblis did not. That Iblis has to be an angel. This is when you take this verse by itself in isolation, stand alone. But when you go to the totality of the data on the subject, and we don't have the time to do that today, but in previous lectures we have done it. The totality of the data in the Quran gives us a different picture. No. Iblis could not have been an angel for this reason and for that reason and for that reason. And then the Quran finally tells us that Iblis or Satan was a jinn. They say he was a fallen angel. We say angels don't fall down. No, we say he was not an angel. So no question of a fallen angel. The Quran says he was a jinn. An invisible being like an angel created by Allah with beyond our capacity to see them. And so from this we get a lesson being taught on methodology by the Quran that you must not make the mistake of taking any verse in isolation, any hadith in isolation. No, because you can make a mistake. Rather, you must get the totality of the data on the subject. And sometimes that data is located outside of the Quran. For example, the first house of worship to be built this is in Surah Al Imran. Lalathi bi Bakkata Mubarakan wa Hudan lil Alameen. It's the one which was built at Bakka. Not Makka, Bakka. Why does the Quran use the word Bakka with a B? Where elsewhere it uses the word Makka. You cannot answer that question unless you step out of the Quran and you go to the previous scriptures. And there you'll get the answer why Allah used the word Bakka. So too with this subject of the punishment for Zina. It seems to be a subject of intriguing importance. I am intrigued by it. Why? Because the last two prophets who were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the world, Nabi Isa islam the son of Mary, and Nabi Muhammad islam the Arab, who was from Nabi Ismail islam Both of these were tested by the Jews on this subject. And for the Jews, the rabbis to come and test two prophets on this subject indicates that it has an intriguing importance. Jesus alayhi salam is sitting with his disciples and others and preaching. And they came, the rabbis. And they brought a woman and they said, we have found her in the act of adultery and they brought her and they said you must judge now what is your judgment they set a trap for him but my first question would be you can't commit zina by yourself you need a man why do you leave him behind <laughs> why didn't you bring him huh is it that the punishment is only for the woman and not for the man? Come on, Rabbi, I want an answer. They have an answer, but we leave that for the time being. <laughs> so it sounds strange to me that only the woman was brought and not the man. Hmm? Nabi Isa alayhi salam is now being tested. You must deliver the judgment what is the punishment for this woman? At that time, every Jew knew. This is 2000 years ago. 
that the punishment was stoning to death. They all knew that. But they were not enforcing it. And they wanted to get rid of this. And they wanted to move away from the law which came from Allah and to substitute for it the law which they will themselves make, you know. It's called secular law today. What did Nabi Isa Islam do? Mash Allah, what wisdom. What wisdom. He said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. He did not say that the law is not applicable. No. He's, he is recognizing implicitly that this is the law. Stoning to death. He is prepared to enforce the law. But since you ask him for judgment, he asks, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Now you cannot raise your hand to cast a stone in fulfillment of Allah's law when you know that you have committed sin because that's what he asked. So the hand is raised, one to raise, but the hand can't raise, can't rise. And so one by one they started slinking away. Until finally she was left alone. She was left alone. And so Nabi Isa Islam has no means now to enforce the law. So he told her to go away and change your way of life. Now, why would they do the same thing when the next prophet comes? I'm intrigued by this subject. And I want to ask you, and I want to ask the wider audience that will be listening to this lecture to conduct this research. What is it in this subject that they should test this prophet and then come and test this prophet with the same thing? Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is in Mecca and for 13 years he's performing his salat in Mecca but not from any and every place only from one particular spot at the Kaaba he chooses one corner of the Kaaba so that when he stands in prayer he will face both the Kaaba and he'll face the masjid in Jerusalem which is the Qibla of the previous Sharia but then came the Hijra and now he is in Medina and when he arrives in Medina there's a very large community of Jews present in Medina and the reason why they were in Medina is because they knew that the Prophet was coming. They knew that the Prophet was coming to Medina. That's why they were there. The, the French say, the French say la creme de la creme. The best of the rabbis were there in Medina. And then they noticed that when this Arab came, Nabi Muhammad is an Arab. When he came with the Muslims, only about 300 or so Muslims migrated, I believe, to, I can be wrong about the exact figure. He now performs his Salat facing the Jerusalem, which is their Qibla, the direction of prayer. And in the process of facing Jerusalem, he has to turn his back to Mecca, to the Kaaba. And no Arab could do that and get away. No, because the entire Arab world recognized the Kaaba in Mecca to be the spiritual center of the Arab world. And so this 
must have created a favorable impression on the Jews the Israelite people that here is this man who is an Arab but yet turning his back on Mecca and turning to Jerusalem Nabi Muhammad did it he acted in this way because the Sharia then enforced in the world was the Sharia which came to Nabi Musa alayhi salam, the Prophet Moses and in that Sharia which came down this is the Qibla because eventually after Musa alayhi salam, other Prophets came and then came Nabi Dawood alayhi salam, and Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, and then the temple or the masjid was built in Jerusalem and so this is the Qibla But that's not all that he did. He fasted with the Jews on the days when they fasted and in accordance with the law of fasting in the Torah. That law of course was, is still there in the Torah after now, from sunset to sunset. No food, no drink, no sexual relations. As a result of both of these things that he was doing, I am praying in the direction that you are praying, I'm fasting with you on the days when you are fasting and in accordance with your law of fasting. He was providing the evidence that he was indeed a true prophet of Allah and that he was following the same religion that they were following. Allah was testing them. They had done many very very wrong things they had changed the word of Allah for example Allah had prohibited money being lent on interest and then they changed the word of Allah the Torah now says that it is haram prohibited for an Israelite to lend money on interest to another Israelite it's still there in the book eh? but it is halal it is permissible that you can lend money and interest to those who are not Israelites. Huh? Is it because they are cockroaches? You can rip them off? Come on Rabbi, we'd love to hear the answer. This is ethically repugnant. In this book, The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel, we have attempted to provide a number of the changes, explaining a number of the changes which took place which they changed the Torah but I want to commend to you the book also of that American scholar Richard Friedman who wrote a book entitled Who Wrote the Bible? An eminent scholar of the Bible, America and he confirms everything that Allah said in the Quran about the changes in the Torah if you change the word of Allah and write with your own hand and you say this is the word of Allah when it is not you commit the ultimate sin it's called blasphemy punishable with death in the Sharia blasphemy in the Quran it's called shirk the one sin that Allah will never forgive if you die without making tawbah hmm? They had committed many, many crimes, killing prophets of Allah, killing prophets of Allah, and then boasting of how they had killed Nabi Isa Islam, Jesus. And so they had terrible punishment for them. But Allah left one door open for mercy. One door. Asa Rabbukum Ayyarhamakum, says the Quran. That one door is the last prophet. No more after him. If you accept him and you obey him and you follow him and you honor him and you respect him and you assist him, Allah is prepared to show mercy. But if you reject him, then the door to mercy will be closed for you. 
and so all the heavens are watching after we arrived in Medina what's going to happen and for 17 months this drama continued until after 17 months the evidence became as plain as daylight that they had rejected Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and rejected the Quran the catalyst was a dear rabbi chief rabbi Abdullah bin Salam took the shahada became Muslim took the shahada became Muslim this is the way it works once the heart recognizes this to be truth then you accept it as truth I got an email a few days ago from someone in Holland in the Netherlands he said Sheikh I've been listening to your lectures and reading your books and I'm convinced that Islam is the truth so I replied so will I invite you to make this declaration la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah come on send me an email so he replied he says I need a little time so I replied and said respect for truth respect for truth is that you never accept anything as truth until you are convinced in your heart that it is the truth so take your time but respect for truth is also that when you recognize it to be truth you do not delay you do not think of consequences what would my wife say what would the family say what would my friends say what would the government do with me no when once you recognize it to be truth respect for truth is that you make no delay in uh, accepting it so he said to me Sheikh I want to make the declaration but I don't trust this internet can I send it to you in a letter I said but you might die while the letter is on its way <laughs> then we can't bury you as a Muslim so I suggest you go to a local Muslim there in Holland make the declaration so he just came rep replied to me this morning yes I'm going to go to the local masjid and make the declaration <laughs> Alhamdulillah I hope he listens to this to this lecture inshallah and we're looking forward to that declaration so we can welcome our brother in Holland to Islam so this is truth this is truth and Abdullah bin Salam recognized it as truth and he took the shahada he took the shahada they also recognized Muhammad والسلام, to be a true prophet Allah says so in the Quran they recognize him the way they recognize their own sons why did they not rec accept him as a prophet why answer because of the changes made in the Torah this book explains those changes the religion of Abraham and the state of Israel that the Torah had been changed in such a way that a Jew cannot accept as a prophet anyone who is not an Israelite and he is an Arab he has come from Ismail -Islam, not from Ishaq -Islam. So if we accept him as a prophet, the implication would be that our Torah is filled with lies. And so they rejected him. When Abdullah bin Salam became a Muslim, he said to the Prophet والسلام, don't tell them, don't tell my people, keep it a secret call them and ask them what do they think of me so the prophet kept it as a secret and he called the Jewish leaders and he asked them what do you think about Abdullah bin Salam and this they praise him he's our leader he's the wisest the learned most learned of all we respect him and then Abdullah bin Salam came out and he said I declare that there is no God but Allah and then Muhammad Allah's blessing be upon him is a messenger and then they started to curse him 
And in this way, what was inside of the heart came out. Came out. And so now they had to do something because it's out in the open. And they started to conspire to wage war on Islam and on Muhammad We don't have the time to give you that story of what was the plan. But it is at this time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now acted. The door to mercy is to be closed. They are different from us, you know. We say that we will stand before Allah for judgment individually, one by one. They say, no, we are not going to be judged individually. We are going to be judged as a community. The whole community will go to heaven. So the door to mercy for that community is now to be closed. Tilka ummatun qad khalat, says the Quran. This is the meaning of that verse. What did Allah do? There's a verse in the Quran of supreme importance for today's lecture. It is in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah. It is verse number 106. And you got homework to do. You got to go back now home and find the Quran and open it to the second chapter and go to verse 106 and read that verse. This is what Allah says. بَعَدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ مَا نَنْسَخْ مِنْ آيَةٍ أَوْ نُنْسِهَا نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا The Quran is speaking about something called Nasr Cancellation Abrogation And the Quran is saying Allah says that He never cancels he never abrogates any ayah an ayah a revelation a law a message he never does so without replace or cause it to be forgotten he never cancels or cause to be forgotten any ayah but that he replaces it with that which is better or that which is similar. He didn't say what he replaced it with something which is different. No. He said that which is better or that which is similar. So if you look at the ayah which is abrogated, mansukh. Mansuk is not an Arab with a shop in KLCC. Mansuk means abrogated or cancelled. If you look, an Islamic scholarship must do this. If you look at that which was cancelled or abrogated, and you look at that which has replaced it, the two have to be similar to each other or one has to appear better than the other not 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 in conflict with each other and therefore have to replace each other no better or similar and this is what now happened Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala effects the first instance of Nasr or cancellation and abrogation. What does he cancel? He cancels the old Sharia of Qibla. The old Sharia gave us the Jerusalem as the Qibla. And now a new Sharia comes, a new verse comes, and the new Qibla is Makkah. But Makkah and Jerusalem it's Ibrahim alayhi salam 
and Suleiman and Dawood alayhi salam no conflict within each other huh? this is Nasr and this is the methodology we have to adopt in the study of the subject of the punishment for zina in the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam the Christians say that we belong to the religion of Abraham the Jews say that our religion is the religion of Abraham the Quran tells Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam thumma uhayna ilik and ittabi' millata Ibrahim hanifa that you also must follow the religion of Abraham alayhi salam so all three of us claim the religion of Abraham and if you want to study the subject of the punishment for zina you have to do it with this methodology go back to the previous sharia then came the second instance of nasr or abrogation or cancellation remember we were fasting with the jews with the israelites on the days when they fasted and in accordance with their law of fasting which as I told you was from sunset to sunset no food no drink no sexual relations and now Allah changes that law and replaces it with another one and when you look at the two laws they are similar but this one because all of Medina is smiling when this law came down lots of smiles this law is obviously better than this one we like this one the first thing we got was this message please a lot of people Allah says lakum. this no halal for you Laylat al-siyam during the nights of fasting rafathu ila nisa'ikum to go to your women meaning your wives for the sexual relations so Medina is smiling the most beautiful thing that Allah has ever created for a man is woman much more beautiful than Sun Wave Pyramid the loveliest thing in the world for a man is woman although there are some in lower Manhattan says differently <laughs> the loveliest thing that Allah has created for a man is woman and now it's halal for you in the nights of fasting you can go to them so we are smiling they are your garments you are their garments you are inseparable it's not that men belong to one jamaat and women belong to another jamaat we pray in the same space in the masjid in the same space in the masjid we're not two jamaats in the masjid we are one the prophet said when women go down in sijda you never heard it did you they took this hadith and put it in cold storage yeah cold storage when women go down in sijda prostration they must remain in prostration longer than the men why he explained that some of the men may not have enough cloth to cover themselves and if a woman were to raise her head to so it would be an unwelcome sight so women were the back and men at the front you wouldn't put women at the front and men in the back, would you? No man would be able to pray. Huh? Can you pray with women in front? No, you'd be thinking about the woman. So, very wisely, Allah put the woman at the back and the men at the front. Because they can pray with me in front, with the men in front. We can't pray if they're in front. Huh? And there was no barrier. No partition, no screen. 
So we and the woman belong to one jama'ah. Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahun. They are your garments, you are their garments, you are inseparable. Alim Allah wa annakum kuntum takhtanuna anfusakum. Allah knows what you used to be doing secretly when you were supposed to be staying away them, staying away from them in the night. Fataba alaykum Allah has turned towards you mercifully wa afaankum and Allah has forgiven you. Fala la bashiruhunna wa abtagu ma kataba Allah lakum. So now you can embrace them and seek for what Allah has written for you. وَقُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْتُ الْأَبْيَدُ مِنَ الْخَيْتُ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ ثُمَّ تِمُّ السِّيَامَ إِلَى اللَّيْبِ إِلَى آخِرِ الْآيَةِ And so we eat and drink during the night until the break of dawn and don't spend the whole night eating and drinking eh? until the break of dawn and then the fast will begin at that time and continue until the night time it's a new law of fasting and we all smiling because it's better than the old one. It's not in conflict with the old one. It's better than the old one. It's an easier law. This is Naskh. And so don't go searching in the Quran, please. To find verses which appear to be in conflict with each other. That is foolishness. That is a rubbish of methodology. No. It is previous revelations which are being cancelled and abrogated. But I was in the classroom at the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies in Karachi, Pakistan, when I was a student. And you know, sometimes you fall asleep in the classroom, everybody happens. But this time, while I was dozing away, I suddenly jumped up. Because the teacher said, we are dealing with Surah to nur And he had a hadith to back him up. That there used to be a verse of the Quran here. And now it's no longer in the Quran. Of course, I couldn't say that in the classroom, but I said to myself, what rubbish is this? What utter rubbish is this? What nonsense is this I'm hearing? That there used to be a verse of the Quran, and now it's no longer in the Quran? Huh? So I waited until the class was over. And I went upstairs to Molana, Dr. Fadur Rahman Ansari, our teacher. And I said to him, Maulana, this is what they just told me in the classroom. And then he said to me, son, they are wrong. They are wrong. No verse of the Quran has ever been cancelled. No verse of the Quran has ever been abrogated. And no verse of the Quran has ever been, excuse me, forgotten. Huh? Allah has given a divine guarantee of protection of the Quran. And if any change is to take place in the Quran, who it is who must inform us? The one who was appointed as the teacher. Wa yu'allimukumul kitab. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, not some Maulana in Egypt or in Pakistan or Sheikh is appointed. No, Allah appointed Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. So he is the one who has to inform us. Oh, well, Allah changed that and he replaced it with this one. And he changed that one and replaced it with this one. And he changed these others and he changed it with those others. That nonsense. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam never gave us that information. He never spoke of any single change in the Quran. Never. And so if anybody else tells me it doesn't matter who he is and the report comes to me I say no that's true that's not true that's false that's false no matter who you are somebody must have fabricated something and put it in the name of a companion of the Prophet and I saw it was done. 
And so abrogation and cancellation and verses being forgotten that Allah has ordained does not refer to anything in the Quran. It refers to revelations which came before the Quran. One more question. Nabi Muhammad is dead and gone. We have the Quran with us now. Is it possible that anything which is now in the Quran now can be cancelled or abrogated? Did you hear the question? Is it possible that anything which is now in the Quran can at some future time be cancelled or abrogated? No! Why aren't you shaking your heads everybody? No, that's possible. Huh? Oh, but there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari. That when Nabi Isa Islam returns, he's going to abolish jizya. Jizya is in the Quran. <laughs> jizya is in the Quran. And the hadith says he could abolish this year. We just, one more nasq still to come. A verse of the Quran which is there in the Quran now is going to be cancelled and abrogated in the future according to Sahih Bukhari. Are you going to believe that? <laughs> Are you going to believe that anything in the Quran was ever cancelled or can ever be cancelled? was ever forgotten or could be ever be forgotten I think it is time for the world of Islam to be taught this subject properly I think it's time for the scholars of Islam to stop what they've been doing this one comes along and tells us that there are 49 verses in the Quran which are cancelled and abrogated he makes his own list what authority do you have? is your name Muhammad al-Islam? And that one comes along with a list of 35. And the other one comes with a list of 25, as though this is Disneyland. And then along came Shah Waliullah Dahlawi, who said they're all wrong, over 300 years ago. And he produced that book, Kitabu Tafsir, Kitabu. Uh, uh, Kitab al Kabir fi Usul Tafsir, I think, yeah. And he says they're all wrong, they're only five. Huh? They're only five. And may Allah have mercy on his soul, he was a great teacher. Uh, Dr. Isra Rahmad Rahimahullah, I have great love for him. And I honor him and I respect him and I will not tolerate anybody trying to change my views on him. Even when a man makes mistakes, as I make mistakes, that does not mean that you have to dishonor him and disrespect him. No. I defer with him, Dr. Isra Rahman. As I defer with others on many issues. And yet I honor and I respect the men of knowledge. And the men who stand up and serve the mission of Islam all their lives. Why should I not do that? Dr. Isra Rahman, Rahimahullah said, I can make it three from five. Mawlana Fadr Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah said, no, they're none. None. No verse of the Quran was ever forgotten. No verse of the Quran was ever cancelled and abrogated. And tonight, today we are in agreement that there can be no future cancellation and abrogation when Nabi Isa al-Islam returns. Okay. And so now comes the third Nasr. In the same way that they tested Jesus alayhi salam. It is intriguing to me. I, I have to try to understand why. I don't know as yet. They know the answer but I don't know. They have now come to the next prophet. Muhammad alayhi salatu was with the same test. The same test. They brought two people. I'm not sure whether it was two, I believe it was two. The last time they left the man behind, eh? And they said that they have committed zina. 
and they've confessed to zina, to adultery. O oh, Muhammad Wasalam, you judge. It's a test. It's a trap. How will Muhammad Wasalam, respond in the case of Jesus? He is prepared to enforce the law. But he says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And when there was nobody to cast the stone, but then he says, woman, you go away. They brought two people who had confessed to zina. And they said, O Muhammad Wasalam, you judge. But they the trap boomeranged on them. Boomerang, I believe, is an Australian term. You throw it, it come back at you. So they threw it and came back on them. He asked, What punishment do you give? My understanding is, and I ask the Jews to kindly correct me if I'm wrong. My understanding is that the Jewish Council of Law, the, Ju the, the Council of Judges, called the Sanderin or something like that, I don't know, that the, the, I can't pronounce the word properly, so excuse me for that. They had already taken a decision about 2,000 years ago, from now, to abandon this law of punishment for Zina that this was a decision taken by the Jewish court to abandon this law, okay? So when the Prophet asked, what law, what punishment do you give? Bring me the Torah. So that book, even with the changes in it, is still recognized as a Torah. Even though the text was corrupted, it is still recognized as a Torah. Bring me the Torah. And then someone was appointed to read the passage pertaining to the punishment for adultery, zina. And Abdullah bin Salam is present. But when he is reading the passage and he came to the verse on stoning to death, he put his finger on it, read over it. Abdullah bin Salam said, stop. Raise your finger. And now read. I'd love to see this video one day, inshallah. So he had to read. That in the Torah, in their book, and I hope the world of Jews are listening, and I hope the world of Christians is listening, that in Allah's scripture, in the revelation which came from the one God, the God of Abraham, the punishment for zina, for adultery, fornication, was stoning to death. So if any Christian or any Jew were to say that this is barbarism, you are insulting the God of Abraham. If anyone who is even not a Jew or a Christian, a Hindu or a Buddhist, were to say that this is barbarism, I'm warning you, you're going to have a very big problem on Judgment Day. Yours is going to be a very pitiful sight on Judgment Day. If you open your mouth to say one word against the law of stoning to death because it came from the God of Abraham and it is still there in the Torah to this day. So when you unleash you are trapped in about a year from now. Remember these words of mine. <clears throat> they said, now of course they're stammering. Well, 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 you know, when the 
rich people, the big people, when they committed zina, adultery, fornication, we had to let them off. Huh? I don't want to mention the name of any country, but we are familiar with that, don't we? Shall I mention any names? <laughs> the big people, you know, the ones with the titles, they get off. <laughs> and when the small people commit the crime, they have to be punished. And it didn't sit well with us. So we decided to abandon the law of God and replace it with our own man-made law. That's what the world is doing today. And so we gave a new law that will make their faces black. Why not red? <laughs> Why black? We make their faces black and we give them a beating. So even in their man-made law, they have beating, public beating for adultery and fornication in their man-made law. Even that law today, they're not enforcing. I'm asking the world of Jews and the world of Christians, when you abandon Allah's law and you made your own law, how come you're not enforcing Allah's law and you're not enforcing your own law? Have you no shame? And here is the world of Islam. Millions and millions of followers of that Arab prophet. And we are prepared today to enforce the law which is your law and which you have abandoned. So they had to read that the law of punishment for zina was stoning to death. They could not enforce it and so they replaced it with this law. Public beating, make the face black. How will Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam respond? Would he say, he who is without sin should cast the first stone? <laughs> no. Like Nabi Isa alayhi salam, like Jesus, so to Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, recognize that this is Allah's law, stoning to death. And he ordered that the two people be stoned to death. The Jews were absolutely astonished because it's about 600 years since last they ever had a person stoned to death. After their, their court had abolished the law. And so now, not only is this man turning in the direction of Jerusalem, not only is he fasting with us, but he's also enforcing the law which we had abandoned. This man must be a prophet. But after they had rejected him, now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us Naskh. The first, the change in Qibla from Jerusalem to Mecca. The second, the change in the law of fasting. The third now comes, and it is in the Quran. In Surah to Nur, which is Surah number 24, Nur means light, in the second verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the law of punishment for zina or adultery and fornication in the new sharia. The new law replaces the old law. The new law never replaces the old law part time, 50%. No, the new law always replaces the old law completely. It's not that you're you could turn to Mecca on Monday and you could turn back to Jerusalem on Tuesday. Well, I shouldn't use Monday and Tuesday because those are Scandinavian gods and goddesses. And Sunday, of course, is the day to worship the sun. <laughs> then you could turn to 
you could turn to Makkah on Yomul Jum'ah, the day of Jum'ah. And then you could turn back to Jerusalem on the day of Sab, the day, the Sabbath day. Hmm? No. The old one is now cancelled, abrogated completely, totally, and replaced with the new one. So too, with the change in Qibla, so too with the law of fasting, and now so too with the punishment for zina. The law of stoning to death is now completely and totally cancelled and abrogated. And that law is now replaced completely with a new law. And that is a public flogging. Well then how come? Millions and millions and millions of Muslims around the world are prepared today and I'm proud of it that this Ummah is prepared today to enforce the law of stoning to death there must be some hikmah some wisdom the answer lies in the hadith that there are at least four hadith in Sahih Bukhari which gives us the view that the law of Islam for punishment for zina is one in which the abrogation or cancellation was part time that if the people who committed zina are unmarried then the new law applies and the old law is cancelled but if they are married then the old law in the Torah is not cancelled it is still applicable and there are a few not many maybe two or three instances in the hadith of Nabi Muhammad enforcing the law of stoning to death what the ahadith do not do and it's too late now for us <laughs> to manufacture ahadith eh? <laughs> well, not for us for people to manufacture ahadith what the ahadith do not do is they do not tell us whether these acts of stoning to death ordered by Prophet Muhammad took place before the revelation came down cancelling and abrogating the old law or took place after it does not tell us but there is a basic principle again of methodology we want to expand methodology now and I won't take much more time the Quran is absolutely authentic there is a divine guarantee of the authenticity of the Quran Allah protects it no hadith has that status that the Quran has not and so listen carefully to my words in fact these are not my words these are the words of my teacher Maulana Dr. Fadl Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah It is the function of the Quran to sit in judgment over the hadith Not vice versa Quran and hadith do not have the same status Not even if it's an authentic hadith You do not have the same status as the Quran But when Jesus comes back he's going to abolish jizya <laughs> And so there's one more nasq of the Qur'an to come now. The Qur'an sits in judgment over the hadith. And so when you find something in the hadith, which is in conflict with the Qur'an, it is with the Qur'an that you must stay. That is the methodology. And there's one hadith in particular, again in Sahih Bukhari, 
in which Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is reported to have said that people will say we no longer find the verse of Rajab in the Quran this is what my teacher was talking about in the classroom and I was falling asleep I woke up we no, we no longer find the verse of Rajab in the Quran meaning it used to be in the Quran it's no longer in the Quran now it dropped out or it was cancelled or it was forgotten well if the verse of Rajam used to be in the Quran and is no longer in the Quran how can you be enforcing it in the Hadith and what nonsense is this that there used to be a verse in the Quran it is clear as daylight that this is a fabrication and when we speak of a hadith in Sahih Bukhari and declare it's a fabrication that does not mean that the entire body of a hadith is now destroyed what nonsense is that the word Dajjal does not occur in the Quran and yet you cannot understand the world today you cannot understand what is happening in the world today without a knowledge of Dajjal and all the information we have about Dajjal is in the Ahadith huh? so because I declare one Ahadith one Hadith sorry in Sahih Bukhari to be a fabrication about this verse used to be in the Quran are you going to respond and say that now Imran is causing the entire body of Hadith to collapse that is frivolous it is not in the same way that we have the courage we have the integrity when we recognize a fabrication in the hadith to declare it's a fabrication so to invite the Jews and so to invite the Christians that when you see in your scriptures that which is clearly a fabrication like it is halal, it is haram for an Israelite to lend money on interest to another Israelite. But halal, he could lend interest, lend money on interest to those who are not Israelites. When you see a fabrication, plain as daylight, it's a fabrication. Do what we are doing here today in Masjid al Husna and declare it to be a fabrication that does not mean that the rest of the Bible is now going to collapse not at all and so we now end by reminding our audience that this is not just an important subject but there's a tomorrow which is coming when the trap is going to be sprung on us and I am while I am proud that the world of Islam is today prepared to enforce the law of stoning to death which is their law not our law anymore I'm proud it is evidence that there is truth in Islam that we are prepared to, to enforce your law that you abandon but despite my being proud of my people we must also recognize that the Quran sits in judgment over the hadith and these are hadiths declaring that the punishment for zina if you are married is still the old law and if you are not married is the new law these are hadiths are fabrications and we must recognize them as fabrication and so when the married couple are brought before the court in Egypt I hope and I pray that the Egyptian court would have the wisdom to sense them, to sentence them for a public flogging. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samir alim wa tawa alayna ya mulana inna ka anta tawa abrahim bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimi. Ameen. Alhamdulillah we have a lot of time for questions and answers. First of all on this subject 
And then after that, on any other subject you want that we've covered previously, yes, Mr. Lah? Is there a verse in the Quran on this punishment for zina? Referring to the, to the Torah. There is no verse in the Quran referring to the punishment that is in the Torah. No. The methodology that the Quran itself has given is that you do not take a verse in isolation. No. If you do that, then Iblis or Satan is an angel. That's a wrong methodology. I explained at the beginning of the lecture that the methodology is that you have to get to the totality of the data. And that is why I had to take you to the three different nas or abrogations. Yeah. Your question is why do we need... You can sit down. The qu All right. We have enough time today. Why do we need to refer to the Torah? in explaining, explaining this subject. I think the evidence is clear from the lecture. Yes. The, the lecture which I have delivered explains why you need to turn to the Torah. Because you cannot understand the subject without doing that. Now, I gave you an example. There's the first house of worship built. Was that in Bakka? الذي ببكة مباركا وهدى للعالمين بكة. So you cannot explain why has Allah used the word بكة unless you go back to the Torah. You cannot. There is no explanation. Okay. The next question. What I said in my lecture is that I am anticipating that the U.S. dollar is going to collapse. But you don't have to accept my views. No. Nobody has to accept my view Unless you are convinced that I am correct I will be surprised and be disappointed If you accept my view simply because it comes from me No If you defer with me, I say well just wait and see Wait and see what's going to happen The US dollar is not collapsing on its own It is a controlled demolition that is taking place and patriotic Americans are trying their best to prevent it. But the Zionist, Judeo-Christian Zionist Alliance, I hope the Americans are listening to me, the patriotic Americans. The Zionist Alliance, acting on behalf of the State of Israel, they are the ones who are bringing about this controlled demolition of the US dollar and hence of the US economy. I believe they themselves don't know what's going to happen. They're guessing. And I also am guessing. I don't know. But I did say this is my view and I hope I am wrong. I hope I am wrong. That when that US dollar finally collapses, it's going to create panic particularly amongst those living in the areas where there are weak paper currencies. My view, and you'll find it at the back in my booklet entitled The Gold Dinar and Silver Dirham, Islam and the Future of Money, it is so small. You have no excuse for not reading it. The Gold Dinar and Silver Dirham, Islam and the Future of Money, we have it now in a new edition which has some additional material. He said all paper money and all electronic money is bogus and fraudulent and haram. But you don't have to agree with me. You can defer with me. If you want to say it's halal, that's your view. No need for any fighting between us, no. Alright. But I have said if you come after me with boxing gloves because I say that this paper money, this ringgit that you're using and all paper and electronic money, I say it is bogus and fraudulent and haram. Your mufti may say something else. 
But if you want to come after me with boxing gloves and you want to demonize me and vilify me and marginalize me and silence me, then that I won't accept. I'll show patience for as long as I can. And then I'm going to respond with a challenge. I'm repeating it again and again. So they're forewarned. And shame on you on that day if you back down when I challenge you. This is my challenge. Armed with all the fatwas that you have. If you are so confident that you are correct. And this paper money is halal. And I say it's haram. Then come. And let us both raise our hands and pray to the God of Abraham. Alayhi salam. The one God. And ask him and beg him to curse with an eternal curse. And to punish with eternal punishment. Whosoever is wrong between us. Hmm? I hope I never have to do that. But my answer to you is that this is my view that the entire world of paper and electronic money is haram. And because of that it has to collapse. But it's a de it is a controlled de demolition which is taking place so that Israel can benefit from America's sorrows and losses. And Israel can replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. Yes, you had another question? Yes? If two people are committing zina, yeah? Oh. Yeah. There are no witnesses. Good, okay. All right. In the the question is if there are no witnesses, how do you deal? with the case of Zina. If there are no, no witnesses, we cannot recognize it as Zina. It may have been Zina. Adultery may have taken place. Fornication may have taken place. But we cannot say that it happened if there are no witnesses. However, in both the cases, when the Israelite people tested the two prophets, in both the cases, in the first case, there were witnesses. We caught them. That's what the rabbi said, we caught them. And in the second case, they confessed. So if you have the witnesses, then you have to enforce the punishment. And if they confess, then you have to enforce the punishment. Okay, any more questions? Okay, the law in Islam now, the new Sharia, which came down. I don't know what is the law in the previous, the law of evidence in the previous Sharia. But in the new Sharia, you must have four eyewitnesses. Hmm? And uh, uh, Nabi Muhammad wasalam, would ask explicit questions that we would not want to repeat here to ensure that this was indeed a full fledged act of sexual intercourse and not a half, half act of sexual intercourse or a quarter act of sexual No, it has to be a full-fledged act of sexual intercourse that he is confessing to, okay? Four, four eyewitnesses otherwise. Any other questions? The question is, the hadith of Sahih Bukhari pertaining to the return of the son of Mary. Remember the hadith speaks of the return of the son of Mary. Eh? Which Mary? There's only one Mary who gave birth to a son while yet a virgin. Only one Mary who gave birth to a son while yet a virgin. So that's the Mary we're talking about. And it is that son who was born of a virgin mother. That's the one we're talking about. He's the one who's coming back. Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of India, founder of the Ahmadiyya movement that is spreading in Britain now, 
he made this fabulous claim that the prophecy concerning the return of the son of Mary was fulfilled in him fulfilled in him his problem is he was the son of a Punjabi woman so you need only five ringgits worth of common intelligence and common sense to recognize I can't understand why can't you recognize it that this is a this is a falsehood he is making a false claim and therefore he should be denounced for his falsehood hmm? but some people don't even have five ringgits worth of intelligence the hadith in Sahih Bukhari is that the son of Mary will return and at that time when he return he will break the cross and he will kill the swine the pigs and he would abolish jizya I think somebody did some rewriting here rewriting like they did the rewriting when they said that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam married Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha when she was six years of age number one he never married her he never married her no marriage ceremony ever took place here on earth <laughs> it is Allah who married them according to the hadith he was informed that she was his wife when she was six I am not a scholar of that subject but there are many who have disputed that that she could not have been six years of age when the vision was experienced that she is his wife hmm? similarly somebody must have done a rewriting of this hadith and he will break the cross it's simple I don't think he's going to be taking an axe in his hand and searching wherever there is a cross and taking the axe and breaking the cross I don't think so I think this is religious symbolism and therefore I understand breaking the cross to be exposing the falsehoods associated in Christian theology with the cross and then he will be killing the swine I don't think that Nabi Isa alayhi salam will be going around with a knife in his hand and every time he catches a pig he's going to kill the pig no I don't think so I understand this to be religious symbolism and therefore he's going to be doing something which will be devastating for a people with whom he's very very angry so they are referred to as pigs punishing them with such a terrible punishment because they boasted we've killed him <laughs> we killed him they boasted he's going to punish them with such a terrible punishment that it is symbolized as the killing of the pigs but this is my opinion you do not have to accept my opinion unless and until you are convinced that it is correct how many times must I repeat that and this piece about the abolition of jizya seems to be something rewritten <laughs> in the hadith because if jizya is abolished it indicates that there is going to be naskh of the Quran at the time when Nabi Isa Islam returns but that's not possible there is no naskh in the Quran there's never been and there will never be any other questions the news 
has just reached us and that Israel killed the Israeli armed forces killed five Egyptian I don't know if they're policemen or their military officers killed five of them was it yesterday um, and that the government of Israel I understand has now apologized to the government of Egypt for the killing of these people um, but uh, that's dust in our eyes the killing of the 11 people in Israel in Sinai a few days ago very convenient huh? very convenient to take the steam out of all the demonstrations going on in in Israel against Netanyahu and his government and suddenly all gone all gone before 9-11 took place Israel was back against the wall world opinion was turning against Israel before 9-11 took place there's a conference on racism and racial discrimination organized by the UN I believe in uh, Johannesburg or Durban either one of the two and in that conference Israel walked out and one country shamelessly had to walk out with Israel only one the United States Colin Powell nobody else walked out with Israel only one because of the condemnation of Israel on the grounds of racism and racial discrimination and so up to September 11 2001 world opinion was heavily against Israel and then suddenly 9-11 takes place timing was perfect convenient wasn't it and suddenly the tables are turned completely and all the condemnation is on Muslims and Arabs and Osama bin Laden <laughs> conveniently a prophet warned us he said that in the last day there'll be great liars so beware and we'll not be surprised on judgment day when we see all the things that are taking place now and the official explanation is so different from the real explanation yeah any other questions yes the question is that there are only 70 million Jews I don't think there are 70 million Jews it's closer to about 14 million and there are more than a billion Muslims how come we cannot deal with them answer is we don't have freedom we are imprisoned by our own governments <laughs> we are imprisoned by our own governments and those who rule over us don't rule over us on our behalf those who rule over us rule over us on behalf of the Zionists the Zionists control our governments <laughs> yes Israel is not alone Israel is not alone in the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah there's a verse which in my opinion could not have been understood until this modern age and if you go into all the tafasir you see what I mean Allah says in the Quran Ba'adawuzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu O you who have faith How much more time do we have? Five minutes O you who have faith Faith in Allah La tatakhithu al-yahuda wa nasara awliya Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies if you use the wrong methodology of taking this verse in isolation you will come to the conclusion that Allah is speaking about all Jews and all Christians <laughs> huh? you can't be Jew you can't be a friend with a Jew you can't be a friend with a Christian no can't be the allies but Allah is not saying that 
he goes on to qualify who he's talking about. He says, Ba'aduhum awliya ubaq. Ba'aduhum awliya ubaq. Do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. In other words, the Quran is anticipating that the time will come when there will be a mysterious reconciliation between some Jews and some Christians and there will be a mysterious emergence of a Christian Muslim Christian Jewish friendship and alliance when that happens do not take such Jews and such Christians as your friends and allies whoever of you become their friends and allies like every government in the Muslim world today and they proudly proclaim their friendship for America oh yes they all do and whosoever from amongst you become their friends and allies you belong to them they no longer belong to us that alliance is now in it's now been established. It's the Zionist Jewish Christian Alliance. The Zionist Jewish Christian Alliance is the one that created the state of Israel <laughs> and which has supported Israel and controls the United States today, controls the US Congress. The United States is the most powerful country in the world today, militarily. And this is the country backing Israel. So it's not just 14 million Jews. It is Israel supported by United States, supported by Britain, supported by Europe, supported by NATO, supported by the most powerful military forces in the world today. And the Muslim world is imprisoned by their own governments. <laughs> but tomorrow we'll be free. Tomorrow Imam al-Mahdi will come. Tomorrow the Khilafah will be restored. Tomorrow Darul Islam will be restored and all these nation states, whether they like it or they don't, all these nation states with their flags and their national anthems and their constitution will all return to the garbage bin of history from where they emerged in the first place. So you're not going to get Imran Hussein pledging allegiance to your state and your constitution and your flag and your national anthem. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا يا مولانا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين آمين Ampunan kepadaku, ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya engkaulah pengampun dosa-dosa besar Tuhanku, aku tidak layak untuk syurgamu 
Tetapi aku tidak pula sanggup menanggung Siksa nerakamu Dari itu kurniakanlah Ampunan kepadaku Ampunkanlah dosaku Sesungguhnya Engkau lah pengampun Dosa-dosa besar Allah faham beli 